If you like, uh, let's turn on our Bibles, and uh, tonight we're going to uh, start off, let's go to the book of Genesis. We'll go to Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3. As we've been studying Luke chapter 22, we've been noting uh, Jesus Christ's Passion Week. And in regard to that, in uh, verses 1 through 6, we are seeing Judas Iscariot uh, put, uh, having in his heart to betray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then going about to plan the betrayal with the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests of Israel. And uh, we also then are in verse 3 noting how Satan didn't trust in Judas to fulfill uh, the evil within his heart, so he possesses him and leads him to make the final deal to betray our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we see that paralleled in all uh, of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John as well. So in that, we've been noting the doctrine of Satan. And in regard to that, we've noted that the cross of Jesus Christ has brought about judgment uh, toward Satan as Jesus paid for the sins of the angelic race as much as he did the human race, as we've noted in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 uh, and 20 specifically. And we also see uh, Jesus Christ himself prophesying in regard to the completed work on the cross, where he says in John 21, 13, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And as we noted on uh, Sunday of this past week, because of the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he is now qualified to judge both the believer and the unbeliever. And for the believer, they are judged to be holy and righteous and forgiveness of their sins, where they will have eternal life and be with God forever. But for the unbeliever, because of their rejection of Jesus Christ's work on the cross and the payment of the penalty of their sins, he is qualified to judge them because he took on their pain, their suffering, their sorrow, their sin, as it were, and therefore he's qualified to be their judge. And because of their outright rejection over and over and over again, he is qualified to judge them to the eternal lake of fire, which he will do for Satan and all the fallen angels as well. In John chapter 16, verse 11, it says, And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. And there we recognize that Satan in eternity past was judged in the first trial of the angelic conflict where he was found guilty and condemned to the eternal lake of fire. But we also recognize that he has appealed that sentencing. And there go we now are entered into the human race where the human race is the appeal trial of the angelic conflict. And when this appeal trial is finished, called human history, then Satan too will be uh, judged once again in the appeal trial to be found guilty. The verdict will come down and then the sentence will be enacted at that time, again after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, he'll be cast into the eternal lake of fire. And as we noted and on Sunday, there's a difference between the judgment. He's already been found guilty in the first trial. He will be found guilty after the end of the appeal trial. But there's a difference between a judgment and the carrying out of the sentence. The judgment has been made. He's already been found guilty. The appeal trial will doubly prove that. And the sentence then will be carried out in the yet near future. Again, at least to 1,007 years uh, from this very day if the rapture were to happen tonight. But in any case, we recognize in God's time, it is in the near future. So Satan will ultimately end up in the eternal lake of fire, as we've been noting, and we're going to see a little bit further, even with this evening's topic. So in regard to our study of Satan uh, and his uh, evil ways and evil schemes and the person that he is, we also recognize that the judgment will be executed against him one day, and there has already been judgments brought against him, and and sentencings that he has already suffered and will continue to suffer, both in uh, uh, we recognize the prophecy of the judgments and then also we'll see the fulfillment of the judgments as well. So he has already received three separate judgments that are given to us within Scripture. And those three start with the first and foremost where he lost his moral integrity. He lost the holiness and righteousness that he was as an uh, angel created by God in perfection, but yet given free will choice. And with that free will choice, he chose to enter into sin when he chose to 
be arrogant within his soul and want to be like God. Even though God created him, he wanted to be like God. Get all the glory, get all the praise, all the honor. And we've noted that already in a lot of detail in Isaiah chapter 14 and then in Ezekiel chapter 28 in verses 14 through 16. So we see how he lost his statue. We see how he lost the integrity within his soul and we see that he lost the authority and responsibility that he had as lead angel of all the angels in eternity past. And now we recognize he's only leading uh, one third of the angelic realm, the one third of the angels who stayed in rebellion that are now called fallen angels. We also call them demons within scripture. So again, Isaiah and Ezekiel both speak about that. We've noted that and read that in detail. We also recognize the pronouncement of judgment against him that is found in the book of Genesis chapter 3 in verses 14 and 15. And this is the scene right after the Garden of Eden episode where he led Adam into sinning and deceived the woman into sinning as well when sin then entered into the world along with spiritual death, illness, disease, and also physical death as well as a result of not only Satan leading the angelic race into sin, he has now led the human race into sin, and this is the judgment pronounced against him in Genesis chapter 3 in verses 14. Uh, going down into verse 15 as well. So in Genesis chapter 3, as we recognize in uh, uh, verse 15 and, uh, uh, excuse me, 14 and 15, it says, And the Lord God said to the serpent, remember the serpent now is Satan, okay? He was the one in the Garden of Eden that led Adam and the woman into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was forbidden for them to do. The only one thing they could not do in the Garden of Eden, he led them to do that. And he deceived them and tempted them to say, God doesn't want you to eat of that because he, you will be like him. And God does not want you to be like him, so therefore you should, uh, he doesn't want you to partake of it. So again, the same temptation to be like God was the temptation that he gave to mankind that he had within his own heart in eternity past. So again, the Lord said, uh, God said to the serpent. Now, let me just pause there again on serpent, okay, because that's what I wanted to focus on. As we progress tonight and then uh, potentially into Thursday night as well, we're going to get into the, uh, the New Testament and the book of Revelation, and we're going to see an interesting Greek word and the phraseology where Satan is called the dragon. And what's interesting about the word there, it's drakon in the Hebrew, spelled with a K rather than a G. So basically it's just a trans, excuse me, in the Greek, it's just a transliteration into the English, as it were. So we have the word dragon. But in the Greek language, by the time John had been written uh, what he was writing, even though there are two different words for serpent, there's one of uh, phyllis, I believe, is the one word, and drakon is the other, but also uh, uh, utilized and translated as dragon, that word drakon also had the concept in the Greek language at that time of the serpent. So when we see the serpent in the Garden of Eden here that Jesus Christ is now addressing, and then we see phraseology about the dragon that he sees in the book of Revelation, remember we're talking about the same individual with the same type of language, and you could translate either of them, dragon or serpent, as it were. All right, so just wanted to give you that, and again, hold that in the back of your thoughts when we get there into the book of Revelation. Now it goes on to say, because you have done this, again, leading the human race into sin, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And then it goes on to say, you shall bru excuse me, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And the second part, or the last part of that, you shall bruise him on the heel, is the prophecy of Satan having the injury against Jesus Christ. Thank you for doing the lawn tonight while well, in the middle of our class outside. Okay, I don't, I don't know if people at home can hear that, but hopefully it will go away in a second. 
Thank you, Satan. But in any case, uh, uh, what we see in the last part of this is the affliction that Satan brought against Jesus Christ, a bruising on the heel, as it were, that is a, uh, a hurtful wound, but it does not kill you. And as we see, Jesus Christ raised on the third day after suffering the spiritual death upon the cross, along with the physical death physical death that followed but then what we see before that talking about he talking about jesus christ god himself he shall bruise you on the head and again bruising on the head is that death blow as it were and it talks about the sentencing that will come against satan where he too will suffer the second death called the lake of fire where he will be in that place for all of eternity so in between you and your seed uh, excuse me, enmity will be between you and the woman and your seed and her seed, talking about Jesus Christ coming from the woman, as we know, uh, the enemy ship of Satan and the fallen angels against God and uh, 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 the believers of uh, throughout the world. But then we have, uh, you shall bruise him on the head and he shall bruise him on the the heel. So again, we see the two uh, prophecies, one of the cross in the last aspect and the final judgment of Satan, where he will suffer the second death. Then we also note the judgment of the cross in Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through, excuse me, verses 19 through 20. We noted that last week. I won't go into a lot of detail on that uh, this evening, but just to remind you of that passage, it says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So again, the judgment that came against Satan happened on the cross where Jesus Christ shed his blood. Again, the shedding of the blood is the uh, the. Uh, analogy of the spiritual death in which he suffered where he paid the penalty for our sins but again through the blood of jesus christ on the cross all things have been brought near to him again all sin has been paid for all sin has been forgiven all sin has been forgotten as it were, in God's eyes. Therefore, all members of the human race, all members of the angelic race, can come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. The believer enters into a personal relationship because of the forgiveness of our sins that we receive and the positional sanctification. For the unbeliever, the brought near, doesn't mean a personal relationship, but now the judgment that Jesus Christ can bring against them, both unbeliever and the fallen angels, he can bring judgment against him because he has paid for their sins. So again, we see that third judgment as a result. So again, as a result of the judgment of the cross of Jesus Christ, he will execute the judgment against Satan and the fallen angels specifically. But in regard to Satan, there will be three stages of the judgment that will come against him. So again, we see another uh, group of three here, and again, three is the number of divine perfection. So all of these judgments uh, are talking about the divine perfect plan of God that come against Satan to find him guilty and then to enact the sentence against him as Jesus Christ is qualified as his judge with perfect righteousness and justice and love, believe it or not, against the evil one called Satan. So the first thing that we find is that Satan will be cast out of heaven and restricted to the sphere of the earth along with all the fallen angels. So right now, Satan and the fallen angels are loose. They can go to the third heaven, God's throne room. They can come into the second heaven called the stellar universe, right down to the first heaven called our atmosphere, and then, as we know, on and around planet Earth. But at one point in time during the tribulation, about halfway through, they're all going to be cast out. Satan himself is going to be cast out, and now he is going to be quarantined, as it were, to the sphere of planet Earth. And that is when we're going to see the great desperation of Satan and him wreaking havoc upon planet Earth as well during that time. But it is the first stage of the sentencing. First, he's going to get kicked out of heaven and again sequestered down to planet Earth. And then other things will follow. Let's turn to the book of Revelation now. We we're in the first book. Let's go to the last book in Revelation chapter 12. 
Again, I want to uh, spend a little time on these uh, chapters uh, in uh, uh, 12, 13 specifically, and then we'll see 17 and 18 as well. Um, but I want to spend a little bit of time here uh, because we've read about the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bold judgments. We've talked all about that, the tribulational time period. Uh, we've noted uh, some of these scriptures already when we talked about those things. But now I want us to just to focus on God's administration of his judgment against Satan during the tribulational time period. So uh, in Revelation chapter 12, and now in verse uh, 7 through 12. Let me see, should I go back? Uh, well, in, just to give you a heads up, uh, in verses 1 through 6, okay, that's talking about the angelic conflict in regard to Satan coming in against an attack against the Israelites, okay, and the woman, again, we can think of Mary as the one who gave birth to, the, uh, to our Lord uh, and Savior in his humanity, uh, and the attack that goes against her, as it were, but it's really talking about the entire Jewish race that she came from and the attack that Satan brings against them, trying to stop the Savior from coming, and he failed in that first episode. Now he's trying to just wipe out uh, the Jewish race so that there's no kingdom for Jesus to come back to, Okay, which he will fail in that as well. So now as we jump down to verse 7, as John writes, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. Okay, again, drakon is the Greek word that we have there, which is synonymous uh, for the Hebrew word that we use for serpent, as we read in Genesis chapter 3. So again, we're talking about the same individuals, the serpent, the dragon. Okay, and uh, as it says, in the dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old. So just so we can put it together uh, in, in our reading of this account, it gives us both Greek words for the dragon and the serpent. Okay, Synonymous words now at this point in the uh, Greek language when John wrote this. But again, two different words, but we're talking about the same individual. The dragon, the serpent of old, the one that was in the Garden of Eden, who was called the devil and Satan. So we're seeing all these titles of this individual as to who and what he is. It says, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So what we've seen thus far, again, a great warfare that's going to go on in the heavenly states, Michael and his angels waging war against Satan and his. And again, that war is to do what? Expel them from God's throne room. And expel them, as it says, from heaven and have them now, uh, as it were, sequestered and uh, kind of imprisoned to only planet Earth. From this point forward, Satan will never, ever be able to go to God's throne room ever again. So during the middle of the tribulation, he's thrown out of that place. And remember, right now he is in that place, accusing the brethren day and night. Okay? He will be cast out of that place and, again, be confined to planet Earth at that point and then until his imprisonment at the end of the tribulation, as we know. All right, so now in verse 10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, in other words, the gospel. And they did not love their life even to death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has already, or excuse me, that he has only a short time. So again, 
somewhere uh, uh, towards the middle of the tribulation, this will occur. As you know, the tribulation will be a seven-year time period. This middle part will only give him a short period of time of three and a half years until Jesus Christ returns. And then his final, or, not, or his second to final imprisonment, as we're going to note uh, in just a minute, will occur at that point. But his time of looseness, his time of being able to go anywhere throughout the universe and even into the throne room of God will be ended and he will be confined only to the sphere of planet Earth. So that's the first judgment that we see coming against him or the sentencing coming against him being kicked out of heaven during that time. Then number two, he will be imprisoned at the second advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And at that time, he will be bound in chains and thrown into the abyss. And where is the abyss? Well, we've talked about that doctrine in the past where we understand that all Human unbelievers go into a place called Hades or Shield, based on Old Testament uh, or Greek or Hebrew language that is being used. Same place, Hades and Shield. They are all thrown into that place. But even below that place, there are at least two other compartments, one called Tartarus and the other called the Abyss. And the abyss is a holding place for fallen angels as well as Tartarus is another place for fallen angels as well to be held who have uh, uh, broken certain rules and regulations in God's plan. Satan specifically is going to be thrown into the abyss. He's going to be held in that place for the 1,000 year millennial reign. And we note that again. Let's just uh, flip to Revelation chapter 20. And in verses 1 through 3. And in verse 1 it says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So once again, we see the fourth term phraseology there. And again, the number four being material. So again, this is a real material being. It says, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer. So no longer will be he the God of this world and uh, no longer will there be a Satan's cosmic system. Because he will be cast away, and again, the millennial reign will only consist of Christ in rulership, literally here on earth, along with believers who begin the millennial reign uh, uh, that uh, uh, enter in with holiness and righteousness, but they also carry their sin nature into that millennial reign. And then there'll be a future offspring that will come during the thousand years. So as it says, uh, so, uh, so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the 1,000 years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. And in, in regard to that, we see the war of Gog versus Magog uh, and uh, the uh, rebellion that Satan will bring on planet Earth with human beings once again that will be quickly dealt with by God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at that time. But here we see the second phase of sentencing. First, he's cast out of heaven brought down to the outer portions of planet Earth. Then when he's thrown into the abyss, which again is one of the compartments below Hades, we have Tartarus, we have the abyss, they are all inside of planet Earth. Okay, So again, now he's going to be held in that place, which is inside of planet Earth. What we also recognize, this being prophesied, and you can read that on your own, in Isaiah chapter 24, in verses 21 through 23. We see the great sentencing of not only Satan, but all the fallen angels in Isaiah 24. So what we recognize as a principle is what befalls the king befalls the kingdom. As we also note, this being prophesied in Daniel chapter 2, verses 37 and 38 where some in the kingdom of Satan have already been imprisoned, as we read in the book of Jude, chapter 1, and 2 Peter, chapter 2, in verse 4. And what we note about that group, those are the angels who broke the rules of engagement of the angelic conflict, came down to planet Earth in the days of Noah, and cohabitated with women, and had offspring called the Nephilim. 
those angels are held in prison, and they have been held since the time of the flood. And they will be held in that place until they are taken from that and thrown into the lake of fire. So some of the fallen angels are already imprisoned, not all of them. We know there's quite a few uh, that still are operational and functional along with Satan. But they are already imprisoned, and Satan also will be imprisoned during the second advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where he will be incarcerated in that place along with them and be held there for the 1,000-year millennial reign. <coughs> Then what we note after that is the final sentencing of Satan that is given to us in Revelation chapter 20 in verse 10. Now let's flip over to verse 10. Where it says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire in brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And what's interesting is at the second advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he takes the Antichrist, he takes the false prophet that are both members of the human race, and he casts them into the eternal lake of fire at that time, which is well before, a thousand years before, any other member of the human race or angelic realm will be there. So they are already cast into that place, and then after the millennial reign, Satan will join them, and then following that, if you read Revelation 11 through 15, members of the human race who have rejected Jesus Christ and God as their Savior, they too will be thrown in that place. So very fascinating when we see the judgment, and we see the judgment of Satan first thrown out of heaven, uh, again, confined to planet Earth, then confined even further into the depths of planet Earth in the abyss, and pretty much by himself at that point in time for 1,000 years, and he's released for a little while. And you would think, you know, like we have in our prison system, you know, we throw people in prison so that they can be, quote-unquote, reformed. And maybe after suffering the penalty for their crime, they'll think, think twice about the crime that they committed and not do that any longer and come out as a full citizen of the country once again. At least that's the hope. Typically it doesn't happen that way. All right? And the criminal who comes out just goes back to their criminality once again. Satan is going to do the same. He could have an opportunity for repentance even at that point where he's loose for a little while. But one more time, and in fact, you can almost think of it, we are in the appeal trial of the angelic conflict, okay, which will continue throughout the millennial reign, and then Satan will be loosed a little, uh, uh, for a little while at the end of that or, or soon after the completion of it. So we see that almost as an appeal to the appeal. So it's almost a third trial and really a third chance that Satan gets. You sat in prison. You never sat in prison before, Satan. You're going to sit in prison for a thousand years. And you're going to have all that time to think about what you've done and where you're going to end up because it's going to happen to you. And I'm going to let you out for a little while. Will you repent or will you go about your evil, wicked ways? And we already know from Scripture he's going to go about his evil, wicked ways. And the appeal trial on the appeal trial then we'll come to a conclusion, and then he will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. So again, three chances. Again, divine perfection. First trial, appeal trial, appeal of the appeal trial. Three times, divine perfection. So the judgment that comes against him will be divinely perfect, as it is against members of the human race who also have rejected Jesus as their Savior. So then we recognize he is cast into the eternal lake of fire along with all the fallen angels uh, in Matthew 25, verse 41, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, followed by the internment of all unregenerated members of the human race. And again, as we've noted, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. But I want to show you Matthew 25, 41, because I've spoken to this but haven't shown it to you. And here we see the preparation of the eternal lake of fire from eternity past as a result of the first trial that Satan endured before the creation of the human race and human history. All right. So in verse, uh, Matthew 24, verse 41, it says, Then he will also say to those on his left, talking about the unbelievers, 
okay, at the end of the tribulational time period, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay? So again, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal lake of fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. But they're not there yet, because we don't see them going there until after the millennial reign. So again, very interesting as uh, uh, those individuals are cast into that place. And uh, Satan once will, one day will be, but the place that they're all going to go to is a place that was prepared for Satan and his angels, which means the ones that stayed in rebellion with him in eternity past. And so God's already created the eternal lake of fire, and it exists somewhere. We don't know where it exists or, you know, the whole uh, makeup of that as we do with Hades, uh, the Tartarus, and the Abyss. We know they're inside of planet Earth, according to Scripture. But again, the lake of fire is just somewhere else. And it's going to be somewhere else completely because it's going to be removed from the members of the human race who are in heaven with God along with the elect angels and God himself for all of eternity. We're not going to know it. We're not going to hear about it. We're not going to think about it. We're not even going to see it. It's just going to be in a place and they're going to be there and that's it and uh, not to affect us negatively ever again. So very interesting as we think about that, because, again, if you were spending all of eternity thinking that your loved ones are rotting away in the lake of fire for all of eternity, that wouldn't be really good heaven for you now, would it? No. So, again, God is going to help us in that uh, mental state where, again, we're not going to have any uh, knowledge of what that is all about or, or even where that is. So we can't go there. We can't help them. We can't rescue them. can't do anything about it. Okay. So whether we either have the kind of the mind of Christ that is able to deal with that, knowing that it's there, and then ultimately we can deal with that in a absolute joy and bliss for all of eternity as God can do that as well knowing that he's perfectly right and just, loving and happy for all of eternity. He knows about the place. Now, will we know about it? Again, he talks about wiping away every tear. That may be a memory uh, wipe away where, again, it won't affect us because our memory won't be there of our relatives or family or friends who are in that place and not even knowing about them. So we don't try to help them or rescue them or whatever the case. Or it talks about we'll just have the mentality of God and Christ where we will be perfect, knowing that perfect righteousness and justice has been enacted. And even though we know that they're there, it's not going to bother us one bit in, in regard to our happiness for all of eternity. So, again, interesting scenarios when we get to the eternal state as to what all of that will be. But the lake of fire, as we've noted, was made ready or prepared, as we have uh, the Greek word, make ready, prepared, by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in what we call eternity past, which is before the creation of mankind here on planet Earth, once the restoration of planet Earth uh, was completed, Genesis 1-2, and then uh, into chapters 1 and 2. Again, uh, our Lord created this place as a result of the first guilty verdict that was brought against Satan in, uh, in regard to his rebellion that he led the fallen angels to against God. But once the appeal trial of the angelic conflict is completed, called human history, and as I've even noted tonight, the appeal of the appeal trial, as we've just noted, Satan and all the fallen angels will be interned in that lake of fire forever and Ever. Never to be heard of, never to be seen, negative, never ever to negatively influence us or any member of the human race or any angelic creature for all of eternity. Locked away and again, uh, you know, out of our periphery forever and ever and ever. So again, we see that in regard to Satan and the fallen angels, and that will be the final sentencing of Satan that has already been predetermined uh, based on the knowledge of God and knowing the free will of Satan as well. That Satan will never rebound and recover. He will never repent. He will never ultimately come to accept Christ as his Savior and humble himself. Instead, he will stay in rebellion uh, you know, once, twice, and thrice, as we've seen, even after internment uh, in the place called the abyss during 
the millennial reign. He never will wake up, and therefore God knows that and will cast him into the eternal lake of fire. And as we said in Revelation 20.10, the devil who deceived them thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, the false prophet, are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So in regard to that, knowing that these things are going to happen, knowing that it's been prophesied, which means it's absolutely going to happen, God has given it to us in His Word, and His Word is absolutely infallible and will not change. We know that these things are going to happen to Satan and the fallen angels. And we could also say they must know it too, okay? Because they know the Word of God. They know the Scripture. They know it better than we do, okay? They've read it. They've read every ounce of it and every jot and tittle, as we say. They know all of it. But they're still fighting to try to destroy it and try to not have it come about. But they know it. And as a result of that, when Satan finds himself especially cast out of heaven and put down on planet Earth, the time of his desperation will be at hand. And that's why the last half of the tribulation is really called the time of Jacob's trouble because like never before he's going to go after the Israelites uh, and uh, try to stop God's plan from being fulfilled. So from that moment that he is kicked out of heaven, he will become a very desperate individual during that time. And he's going to try to do everything possible to avoid the certain judgment and sentencing that has been determined against him. And that's why, again, he's going to bring up the Antichrist. At first, he's going to start off as a wonderful individual, the greatest world ruler that the world has ever seen. Everybody's going to be falling in love with him. And it's kind of interesting in our own history, again, uh, if you're uh, my age or older, and actually uh, 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 yeah, I, was right around about a year, I was about a year uh, old when it happened, but when John F. Kennedy became president and then was assassinated, okay, again, they still talk about him today and how much of a loved president, wonderful individual. And he had all this charis uh, 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 charismatic nature to him, and all the charisma in the world. People fell in love with him, fell in love with his wife and the beauty that she had, and just, you know, fell all over themselves about them. And then he was killed. And the whole country was, you know, in mourning. And we even see it today, how he is still venerated as a president even though we see the evil side of him as well, okay? And that's come out too over the years, but we still lift him up on high. And so he was wounded in the head, and he never recovered from that wound. This Antichrist is going to be wounded in the head. He's going to recover from the wound. So again, it's as if John F. Kennedy was raised after his wound, how the world would view him at that point in time, okay? So John F. Kennedy personified, okay, and magnified even more so. That's what this individual, the Antichrist, is going to be like. He's going to seem to have all the answers. He's going to seem to have all the power, all the authority, help all the people. Wonderful individual. They're going to venerate him as the Christ and the God of gods. And that's all going to happen during the tribulation. But then halfway through, when Satan gets cast out of heaven and, uh, you know, the Antichrist tries to set up his image uh, in the temple that is rebuilt in Jerusalem at that time, that's when the Jews are going to realize, no, 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 this isn't Jesus. This isn't uh, the, our Savior. This is not our Messiah. And they're going to reject him, too, at that point. Okay? And that's when Satan gets cast out of heaven as well. And that's when he's really going to take all the power and authority and rulership and signs and wonders that he has been presenting. Now he's going to turn them on to the people of the earth, especially the unbelievers and especially the Jewish race. And there's going to be a horrific holocaust during that time of Jews and Christians. Again, anyone who does not receive the mark of the beast uh, will have their life in jeopardy during that time. And it will be a very horrific time during the last three and a half years because that's the time of Satan's desperation. 
And, again, and he's going to try to create a utopian society. He's going to try to create a, a power and authority to overcome God and Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, you know, foolish enough to have all the armies of the world come down to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the uh, plains of Megiddo in Israel, which is just a little bit north of, you know, where Jerusalem is. And they're all going to be coming down, marching on Jerusalem to overthrow and take over and think that they're going to win the kingdom and the angelic conflict is going to be completed and fulfilled at that time in their favor. And then Jesus Christ is going to return along with you and I and just totally wipe them all out. But they're going to try and try like hell, as it were, to overcome and overthrow the sentencing and judgment that has already been pronounced against him. And in his desperation, again, he's going to attack Israel. As I said, the greatest holocaust of all time, the greatest time of anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, throughout human history, there's been all kinds of anti-Semitism. What do you think the Spanish Inquisition was all about? Catholic Church was trying to kill off the Christ, uh, excuse me, all of the uh, Jews at that time to wipe them out. Uh, during World War II, Hitler was trying to do the same thing. And there have been other holocausts of the Jewish people, of certainly, you know, the time of Moses, okay? Let's kill all the, the newborn babies so that the Messiah doesn't come forward. During the time of Jesus, let's go in and kill all the babies in Bethlehem so that the Messiah, the king, can't come forward. Again, time after time and other times throughout human history, there has been great holocausts against the Jewish people as the chosen ones of God that Jesus Christ is coming back to to fulfill all his promises that he has made to them specifically. During the tribulation, he's really going to go after the Jews like never before. And again, if anybody thinks that uh, what happened during World War II that we know about uh, was bad, it's going to be even worse during that time. But as I said, anti-Semitism uh, has always been throughout human history because Satan and his cosmic system don't want the Jews, and they don't want them to go forward as the chosen race and as God's people and for a kingdom to be theirs for all of eternity. He wants the kingdom for all of eternity. And so that's why in our society, especially as a client nation unto God, we can never have any anti-Semitism within our nation as a national entity. There will be idiots that will be anti-Semitic, you know, throughout our uh, generations as we see it from time to time. And the idiots who, uh, you know, go and they turn over the uh, gravestones or they put swastikas on schools or different places of gathering for the Israelites. Again, you know, that's anti-Semitism. It's part of Satan's cosmic system to get people to hate the Jews and try to destroy them. So that will continue and it will amplify leading up even to the tribulation. But during the tribulation, it's going to come on like never before and it's going to be uh, completely uh, horrific. As we see in Revelation <coughs> chapter 11, uh, verse 15, going all the way down to chapter 12, verse 17, uh, we see this anti-Semitic type of mentality. So let's go to Revelation chapter 11 in verse 15. But so in 11:15, this is the seventh trumpet, which leads to the bowl or the vile judgments that come again, uh, come come after. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there arose a loud voice in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The Twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, uh, we give the, uh, you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty who are and who was because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. This is during the middle of the tribulation. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to give their reward to your bondservants, the prophets, and to the saints and to those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in the temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hail storm. Now in chapter 12, verse 1, where I noted before, it says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and her head 
a crown with 12 stars. Okay, so you get a woman, and again, a crown with 12 stars, talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, and she was with child. So we see Mary, you know, giving birth to Jesus, but it's really the Jewish race that is giving birth, is what's in view there, to the child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And this is where we see him being a part of the revived Roman Empire, which is you know, part of the European Economic Union today. Uh, and it was m and uh, it's more than just an economic union, but the EU. Uh, and he's going to come out of that, okay, and take rulership and authority over that. And that's going to be the revived Roman Empire that he starts ruling from and again to overtake the world eventually. All right, so let me also say a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and his heads were on uh, was seven diadems seven crowns okay so when we see the great red dragon that's where we get our cartoon character pictures of satan as a red epidermis individual with the horns coming out of his head and the pitchfork tail as we're going to see in verse four so in verse four it says in his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven so not the stars of the earth Okay, from the woman, okay, but the stars of heaven. This is the angelic race, as we talked about already. Swept away a third. So at least one third stayed in rebellion. Maybe only a third rebelled, but we believe all had rebelled and a third stayed in rebellion. He swept them away and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that she gave birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So again, we see the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see all of that, the birth. Uh, we see the whole thing in verse 5. All right. So in verse 6, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, so that so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days. Basically, that's the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Okay, So there's going to be a place for the Israelites to, uh, uh, to have a refuge, a place of nourishment, again, going into the wilderness. Maybe there's going to be another great dispersion as we have Israel coming back together as a nation today. Maybe there's going to be another great dispersion of them. But there will be places for them to go to during the last three and a half years of the tribulational time period. And then we read already verses 7 down through 12. Now in verse 13 it says, And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Again, the Jewish people. And the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman, again, the Jewish people, in order that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time, a times, and a half a times, again, three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent, the great dragon. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman. Now, that's false doctrine, okay? That will be a doctrine of anti-Semitism so that the rest of the world, wherever the Jews are, will attack them and go after them, okay? So the, that's false doctrine coming out filled with anti-Semitic overtones, all right? And so it says, uh, you know, come out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. In other words, yeah, they took it in the false doctrine, but yet there was still protection for the Jewish people. Now in verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. 
So again, you know, great analogy there, and we see uh, uh, different uh, types and typology, and even during the life of Jesus when they went off down into Egypt, and then they came back up uh, to Jerusalem at the age of, uh, after he, uh, I guess, was a, a, a young uh, a boy at that point in time. And we know at the age of 13, he entered into the uh, uh, temple once again. That's the next time we see him after going to Egypt. But again, we see how the earth protected him, the earth swallowing up uh, the anti-Semitic uh, 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 false doctrine that is being preached during that time. But again, we also see this happening once again during the tribulational time period where Satan will go after him once again. So in regard to that desperation, I'm going to give you this first uh, uh, point in regard, sub point, and then we're going to come back on Thursday and finish up the sub points of his desperation. But the beginning of the desperation is a great holocaust of Israel. And as we just read in the seventh trumpet found in Revelation chapter 12, verses 12 through 17. So that's the first part of it. Now, as we enter into the tribulation, Satan was desperate during the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's why we saw a lot of demonic possession during that time period as well according to scripture he tried to kill off jesus by killing off the babies uh, in uh, bethlehem as we know but yet he was uh, not successful in that endeavor during the uh, tribulational time period once again he's going to try to kill off not the baby of jesus christ or the adulthood of him because he can't but again his people that he is going to come back and establish a kingdom with so he's going to try to kill off the Israelite people so there is no kingdom for the king to return to. So that will kick off a great holocaust against the Israelites during that time as we just read. And so again, we see the desperation of Satan cast out of heaven down to planet Earth, now going after the people of Israel like never before and attacking them in a great holocaust during that time. And as we come back on Thursday, we'll see more in regard to the desperation and the maneuvers that he's going to uh, 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 take place and bring about as we go into further depths in the book of Revelation on Thursday night. But I'm out of time for tonight, so let's end here. All right, so Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us this understanding and knowledge of the uh, end times and uh, what uh, will be happening. But more importantly, for us in our day and age who will not be part of that here on earth, to have the strength and confidence of knowing your word and knowing the final uh, uh, sentencing that will be brought against our arch enemy, uh, Satan himself. And knowing that your great power will bring about all these things and your great protection for us too as we deal with that in our own time period as we get closer to those end times. So, Father, we ask for your guidance and protection in our lives each and every day and for our travel blessings home this evening, all by the power of your Holy Spirit and through the word of God in our souls. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you very much. If you have any questions about that, let me know.